Thank you for downloading the Hong Kong Writers Circle podcast. For more information, please visit our website hkwriterscircle.com. Circle podcast, episode 32, first published in October 2017. In this episode, Samuel Ferrer introduces his novel The Last Gods of Indochine and gives a masterclass on editing a novel for publication. Now, as a classical musician, we are we are trained to put ourselves in front of other people and to be always getting critical feedback. So I already had that mentality when I came to workshopping and getting critique with writing. So I knew even as hard as it was or if I, my, feel, my ego was bruised, I always knew that was part of the process, and so I didn't give up. Hello. Samuel Ferrer is the author of The Last Gods of Indochine, for which he became the only non-Asian to have ever been longlisted for the most prestigious literary award in Asia, the Man Asian Literary Prize. Uh, The Last Gods of Indochine was released in 2016. Originally from Northern California, Sam graduated from Yale University and the University of Southern California, spending a year in Paris in between degrees as a recipient of the Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship. He is also a double bassist with the Hong Kong Philharmonic Orchestra, and the creator, songwriter, and bassist for the acid jazz R&B group Shaolin Fez. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, Simon. It's very good to be here. Nice to have you here. And we are going to talk about your novel, The Last Gods of Indochine, uh, your historical novel. Um, And it begins with the main character, um, Jackie, embarking on a voyage to Southeast Asia with a blank journal, a copy of a 19th century travelogue, and the intention to write something... And I wonder whether things started off similarly for you. A bit. Uh, I had I had moved to Hong Kong, and um, at the top of my list of places I wanted to travel to was Cambodia and Angkor Wat, and so that was the first trip I made after I'd only lived in Hong Kong for a few months. And so yes, I did pack some books with me, but I didn't pack a, a blank journal, and I wasn't even writing at that time. And I, I set off I, as a tourist, um, had an amazing time. Um, But while while I was there, I learned about the explorer Henri Mujo, and I came across some amazing photos from the 1922 Colonial Exposition, uh, whereas they they recreated the third level of Angkor Wat to scale in Marseille, France. And um, so so the, the tourists of that day who traveled to Marseille were walking around in their winter coats and they're driving their cars up to the steps of what looks like to be Angkor Wat, but actually it's a place in France for the, the colonial exposition. And I was rather blown away by this image because it just, it, it, it portrayed an era that seems so different from our own where um, where the, the kind of funding and interest for something like this and, and exploration was at its height. And this was quite popular in Europe at the time. And so this is something that a lot of people would have been interested in. So I was captivated by that exposition, by that era of the the, the, um, the Belle Epoque, and this, especially this explorer, Henri Mujo. And when I came back from that trip, I had I had had the idea that maybe someday I would write a novel of my own. And I, I felt very insp- inspired by Daniel Mason's Piano Tuner. Have you ever, are you familiar with mm. that book? Okay, well, around the same year, um, a book had come out by Picador uh, that uh, was by a young guy, Daniel Mason, who um, who was actually uh, studying medicine, and it was set in Burma, also um, historical fiction. And I read that. It was a very rich setting. Um, it was a fine story with a great twist at the end, and I thought the writing was good, but nothing truly exceptional. And so I thought maybe I could do this. Mm. Um, certainly in terms of setting, that's just, that's just that's just a lot of research. It's just a lot of hard work and hours and research, but it's not, um, it's, it's something really anyone can do if they put their time into mm. it. So, uh, so um, I eventually made a decision to, to write a book, and um, instead of writing about him per se, Henri Mujo, 
I decided to create a fictitious granddaughter for him who was going to attend this exposition in Marseille, but they had sent her to Indo Indochina to first see the um, the archaeological site there. And that's how the that was the first kernel for writing this book. Right. So I think what would be very helpful, um, especially for people like me, would be to very quickly look at the geography and the names. So the title of the book is Indochine, which is a little different from Indochina. It's just the French pronunciation of of French Indochina. So the French would say Indochine. Um, and what and area is it? That, that would be about? modern. It's not just Cam it's not just Cambodia, is it? It's no, a bit bigger no it, it's it's modern day Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, um, which is would be the most substantial French colonial. Um, site outside of say Algeria which was quite close to France relatively speaking and this would be not only extremely remote but also quite substantial in size and an economy and it i agree i think it is a really fascinating period because it was a time when people as you say had the interest to explore these far off lands and had the ability to do so but think that it really they really were leaps into the unknown. I mean, people really didn't know what they were going to find and when they went to such faraway places. Well, absolutely. And so Henri Muho, what he did, he was based in Bangkok, and what he would do is make excursions into modern-day Cambodia um, and eventually got to Angkor Wat uh, with, by elephant back and with two guides only. He didn't have this, this team or entourage. It was just him and two guides. Mm. And he, when he got there, he, he kept an extensive journal, and he was also very good at drawing. And what happened is he ended up dying of malaria in the jungles of Laos, which is actually the opening scene of my novel. And, um, but his, no his journal was returned to the Royal Geographical Society, who published it. And it became a, a, a very uh, significant book, uh, very popular, because it was he was sort of the... The, the, the French uh, exploration hero and, and martyr and and people were very interested in the colonial sites so far out there they're very interested in him the drawings were um, fascinating and his writing was very good too mm. and he was comparing Angkor Wat as being greater than anything Michelangelo had ever done mm. so so this was this was quite a claim it was quite extraordinary because of course Western culture wanted to believe that they had a, a stronghold on the greatness of even ancient civilization um, with the Greeks and Romans and here was here's someone saying uh, there's something even better and what I read when I did a little bit of research on Wikipedia is that it, it he his um it was sort of regarded as a him discovering Angkor Wat, but in fact, actually, other people had been there before. Is that that's correct? He um, there there had only been a handful of Westerners who had ever been there before. I think um, maybe a Portuguese missionary and maybe a couple other a couple others, but they. Um, their journeys weren't really well known. And so because of his journal, he was credited with, quote unquote, discovering Angkor Wat um, and the temples there. So he was credited for it, but it's not it's not really true as in terms of being um, the first Westerner there. That's not really even, even true. And then, of course, locally, they knew about it. It was never a lost, hidden um, temple. The locals always, always knew about it, of course. Mm. And his drawings really are quite amazing to, yeah. to look at. Yeah, he, he was quite talented, Yeah, for sure. So that is all pretty much that is true that we know. And my next question is, where does the history end and the fiction begin? I mean, you already mentioned that um, Jackie is, a, is your creation. But... Right, she's my creation. She is the main, the main character of, the, of one of two parallel stories. And so she goes to the archaeological site, which is called the uh, Ifio um, or uh, L'École Française d'Extrême Orient, which was the French archaeological site. She goes there and she interacts with um, a number of the, the of uh, scholars there and a director there. And those are mostly um, almost almost the entire staff, I think, is I've taken from history and um, and based their characters upon the actual historical people who were working there at that time. And there's a significant amount of historicity in that that's actually quite accurate. Uh, this, the, the other story is set in 13th century Cambodia, and it's the ancient kingdom, the ancient Khmer kingdom. And that's based around a boy 
who uh, seems to have miraculous powers, and it creates a, a lot of a lot of drama in the sectarian world that he lives in, and um, a lot of political drama, and that has some history, but not as much as the as the um, the nineteen twenty one story. So in that case, I uh, there are some figures, some characters that come from history, including the king and queen. Um, including actually the chief priest, but mostly just in terms of name and maybe a couple other factoids. Otherwise, uh, the facts, they're just, it's not, uh, there. there's not a whole lot of history in their, those characters. And there's also some appearances by some other, um, some others, such as a, a Chinese emissary who, in fact, wrote the only, I think, surviving um, book account we have of that culture. And it, uh, it's been translated in different languages, and it's something that I relied upon heavily for my own research to create the world of 13th century Cambodia. Mm. And what's quite nice about it, and I think that we'll get on to this later, is that you, uh, you re I mean, when, when you mentioned that, I wondered, and I thought, I, I bet that is a real account that was written by the, the Chinese emissary, as you mentioned. Um, and... And that actually crosses over into both um, of the parallel narratives. So we, we get to meet the Chinese emissary. And also his account is talked about in the 1920, um, 1920s narrative. It, it's, well. actually, it's actually, I think it's talked about in both stories. Um, she, Jackie mentions it as she, that she comes across it in the library, which is a, a little... A little tidbit that I think a lot of readers could miss, but she she does she does mention coming across it, and then he I believe uh, I haven't read the book in a while, <laughs> but I, I believe that uh, the emissary himself mentions is he, is he mentions that he's that he's writing he's making an account of what he okay. sees in their culture. So he is the he is the character. In fact, the, the, the he Mandarin. is the character, the yeah. Mandarin. Yes, right, yeah. and he and he mentions that he is is making an account, and, it, and it's actually a significant character in terms of the the, the plot development. Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, it wasn't a tidbit at all. That that for me was part of what I really took away from it. The how that you were blending history and fiction, but at the same time, it you were making it clear. It seemed very clear to me which bits you had taken and which bits you hadn't, which didn't take me out of the world at all. But it, it was clear. It's like, yep, yeah, I'm pretty it, sure that's a real document. It is a piece of fiction. And I do I do have, um, I am responsible for actually making it clear what is what. And so that's why I have an afterword where I talk at some, some length uh, to explain what is what so that people understand um, which characters actually existed and to what extent I accurately portrayed them or not in the story. Why don't we have a, a little reading to introduce um, the character of Jackie? The, this is a scene uh, early in the in the novel, actually, in the, from the the first chapter. And what has happened is um, in in the prologue, Henri Muho has has died in the um, malaria from, from malaria in the jungles of Laos and has been hallucinating, and um, and that's really what his dying moments are, and. Meanwhile, he fast forward to um, about 60 years and his granddaughter, uh, Jacqueline Muho, is visiting her great aunt, which was his cousin in Paris, on her way to Indochina. And, and her great aunt has been questioning why she needs to make such a trip by herself. And she's been having to explain herself. So um, they don't know each other very well. Uh, but uh, so it's a bit of an awkward uh, scene for them. Jackie hadn't seen them since passing through Paris during the war, during her misguided effort to help as a nursing assistant. After almost four years, she barely recognized them, these family strangers, Adele less like a woman, Jean-Luc more like a man. Sitting in their presence again made Jackie imagine another universe where she had been raised in proximity to Adele, where maybe they would have had an affectionate and endearing relationship, a place where they could be at ease and share laughter. As it stood now, she couldn't even tell if Adele was happy to have her there or not. Indeed, to Jackie, it seemed a bit pretentious of her great aunt to interrogate her like this. She had already endured enough back home. The maid returned and offered a box to Adele, who waited for her to leave before opening it. She withdrew a trinket on a chain, dangling it in front of her face with one age-spotted hand while inspecting it with the other. 
Jean-Luc watched attentively as Adele handed it across the table to Jackie. I want you to have this, she said. Jackie took it and rolled it over in the palm of her hand. It was a small brass compass. It belonged to Henri. Now it belongs to you, Aunt Adele said. Jackie looked back up. The interrogation was over. She had never been given an heirloom before, let alone such an intimate gift from her grandfather's illustrious journey. Gingerly, she caressed it and studied the black cardinal points through its bulbous glass. North looked fat. Holding it in her palm, she envisioned her grandfather holding it in his and felt a kind of yearning in the hollows of her chest. She only knew him through the book she had almost memorized while growing up. I don't deserve this, she said. Are you sure you want to give it to me? Yes, of course, Aunt Adele replied. It belongs more with your family anyway. Your uncle gave it to me when I was your age, knowing how close Henri and I had been. I might as well have lost an older brother, not a cousin. Jackie rose and crossed around the table and kissed Aunt Adele on both cheeks. Adele held on, touching her face and admiring her dark auburn hair. You have his intelligent eyes, she said, before letting her return to her chair. Adele lifted, lifted her bowl of coffee and wispy steam pirouetted over it. Sitting tall and proper, Jackie mirrored the gesture. Jean-Luc craned his head down to his like a horse. Jackie blew over hers and saw her faint face lapping on the liquid. For an instant, she even thought she saw a face not hers. Jacqueline, if, if you insist upon making this trip, then I would like you to do a favor on behalf of the family, but it may be asking too much, Adele said. Jackie peered over her bowl, content her great aunt seemed to have given in. Yes? I would like you to place some flowers upon Henri's grave in Laos. It would mean a great deal to me to know that, after all these years, Henri's kindred have finally visited his grave. In fact, I thought you could take a photograph of it for me. I would like that very much. We're introduced to a period setting in chapter one, in fact, in the part that you've just read, uh, which is 1920s Paris, through the very deliberate appearance of images from that era. Uh, flappers sitting in a cafe, a citron type sea that passes them outside the Gare de Lyon. Um, I mean, I say deliberate, It's I think it's for people like me who know like one or two things about that period and to uh, to, to help you, you know, the, the, the general reader along. Um, what were the challenges of creating an authentic period setting on the one hand and making it accessible to the general reader on the other hand? Well, I think I don't think it's just only a tidbit that that um, some readers would appreciate. I do think the general readers do appreciate the details of being um, that transport them to another era and to another world. Uh, when with all of the editing and feedback and workshopping and agents and publishers and editors that have looked at this, there was absolutely, actually, I actually can't think of one time where there was any second guessing of the historical setting in, term, in terms of it being too much details or too, too many facts in there. From what, I, from what I gather and from what I enjoy as a reader, I, I think people like being transported that way. Um, historical fiction is it's it's a it's fascinating because it's there's a major downside and upside to writing it. The downside is there's an incredible amount of research involved, and therefore it is just simply more time consuming. There's there's no way around it. It takes more time to write historical fiction. the The upside is that throughout all this process of research, as as far as I'm concerned, it really there's a lubrication of my own creative process. All these ideas start coming to me about well, what if this happens, and what if that happens, or what if, and all these what ifs about um, even about the characters, or maybe about the plot. That ideas that are stirred up as I'm as I'm doing research myself, and so and especially for a, a debut novelist such as myself. Um, that kind of inspiration is very valuable, and so I made the most of it. I I usually took ideas and just run would run with it, and many times they would pan out. Not not always, but many times they would. So I didn't I didn't worry too much about not making or, or of, of overdoing it with the facts because I think I think people enjoy it on that level. Generally speaking, mm, sure, yeah. As you say, I mean the the examples that I picked out were. Um, you know, 
add to uh, the atmosphere, I think, especially of that scene where she's just about to begin her journey. But I mean, there are other examples, as you say, which are character based. Uh, without wanting to spoil anything, I, um, her response to certain romantic overtures, I think, were quite of their time as well. I would hope so. Mm. I, I would hope so. Um, and she is definitely a naive, definitely an inexperienced um, young lady. And and that's all. That's all. That's actually not uh, easy to write about. She's withdrawn. She's introverted. And as a character, that's that's also a challenge. And and we can maybe talk about that more when we talk about uh, writing and, and editing. Um, but I would say that, that, yeah, I was trying to, to get the characters to portray that era as well. I wonder, I mean, obviously writing um, a, a piece of historical fiction or, or anything with a period setting, as you say, there, there, of course, there's going to be a lot of research. And if it's a period that you're not familiar with, then you would expect there um, to be a lot more research. But I suppose in a way, you, you, you even if you're writing about your own time, you you would really there's no reason why you would not also still do a lot of research to make sure that you are presenting your own time in an in an accurate way do you see what i mean i wonder if we ever write in a setting that's not that doesn't require that same sort of level of period detail in, in well i think there'd be for, for a modern story uh i think I, I think you always have to be careful that you that you of what you're of what you're assuming and you can make, even make wrong assumptions when you're thinking of your own culture, um, and other people will, will will pick up on that. So, but I do think, generally speaking, you 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 know the world that you you live in, and it's easier to write in it. I have two ideas for another novel, and and one of them is modern, and one is historical fiction. And the idea of writing a modern one is sounds like like such a relief to me, <laughs> um, because writing historical. You, you really have to dig into that and you can make a lot of wrong assumptions, a lot. And, um, and I certainly did in my rough drafts and, and early, early revisions and people called me out on it. Um, but I think, I, th I think at the end of the day, if you, if, you, if you really put in the research and you get enough feedback, you should be able to come up with something that, that's clean and doesn't have uh, hopefully any, any mistakes in it. Mm -hmm. I suppose it, one thing that I suspect might have been quite tricky um, would have been to write without the benefit of hindsight, as it were. So, I mean, it takes place between the world wars um, and you, you you know what's going to happen, right. but you're not a, you can't really reveal too much. That must have been right. quite quite a challenge. I suppose. Sh sure. Well, what was a biggest what was a bigger challenge was actually just uh, the, the setting of of um, of the colonies, because for them, it was just an assumption that this is all fine, that what they're doing was fine. In hindsight, we can look back now and say that there was, the whole concept was rather abhorrent. It was absolute exploitation of the entire region. There's, there's no question about it. Um, and that's a touchy subject. So when I, was, when I had written the, the rough draft, um, maybe around the time I finished it, I remember coming, coming across a review, whereas someone had said, a critic, an Asian critic had said, I wish Westerners would give up on the colonial novel. Um, and something about the romanticization of, of the Orient. And, and I, I thought, wow, ouch, okay. Um, but I think, I think they have a point. Uh, I don't think, I, I don't accept it as something, I believe anyone can write about any culture or any mythology for that matter. Um, nothing's off limits. I mean, we're, we're all in this together. We're all on this planet together. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, and me writing about uh, Christian mythology is, I think, rather boring to me um so uh so instead you said something in, in the colony in the french colonies and this is already a touchy subject so the way i handled it was that i, I tried to not sugarcoat anything um the characters are not heroes they have their faults they have their assumptions they have they are naive um, and they even have some, even some, they're even a bit judgmental. Okay. And, and, but I think, I think that would, would have rang true. 
at that time. And I tried not to, to pretend like that did not exist. Um, also, along with that, I tried to, in the background, there is this political tension going on. It's very obvious. It's clear there's some areas of Indochina that are not at all happy about the French being there. There's others that are starting to align themselves with, with um, Russia, in fact. Mm. And, and, of course, everyone's wondering what the hell any of these people are doing there in the first place. So that tension's always there in the background. I don't, I don't brush that under the, the carpet. It is there. And of, course, and, of course, we know in hindsight that this is all going to explode um, years later. Um, which is absolutely tragic. At that time, they, of course, did not see that that was going to happen. So I just wanted to make sure that that tension was there politically um, and that I was not ignoring it and that the characters were not... Um, that, they were, that, that they were portrayed in, in a, what I would think is an honest way. Mm, sure. It uh, amuses me that one of the characters, um, I, he wears a, a little... Union Jack pin is that right on 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 his clothes? To, yes, uh, to emphasize that he's not French. Uh, yeah, he he carry he carries around a little a little fl- Union Jack uh, flag in his pocket, and I actually I don't remember where I came across that, but that did come out from my research. Again, talking about research that that stimulates the imagination. That's that's an example of that. Somewhere in my research, I came across something where where some of the the, the colonials there might carry around a Union Jack flag just to show to locals to say, hey, I'm not with um, the French or, hey, I'm not with the Russians. Mm. Um, and and so things like that really stimulated my imagination in terms of, okay, well, I got I to gotta portray this. This is, this is too good. Mm. What decisions did you make about uh, writing French dialogue and the dialogue of other languages in English? That was, uh, I wasn't sure how to approach that at first. And um, in the end, what I what I settled on was that in the opening scene, when Jackie goes to Paris and is visiting her aunt, um, they start to talk and then she, the aunt tells her, oh, your French has become quite commendable. And so at this point, the reader knows, oh, they're speaking in French. I'm reading in English, but they're speaking in French. And um, and then early on, there's some very, very short exchanges she has with other people that might be in French, um, just so we can we can be reminded that this is a, the French culture, this is the French language, in fact, um, and then it it carries on in English, and I think at at some point it's safe to assume that the the reader understands that and has accepted it. The there is though there would be some elongated scenes that in fact would have been in English when she's traveling there because one of the characters she comes across is is English. And um, and in fact, she would have been uh, fluent in both languages because the historical person of Henri Mujo did, in fact, um, before he set off on this journey, he did move and relocate to England where he married and had children. And so he would have had um, grandchildren who were were French English, in fact. Mm. I, I really like the way that you handled it, actually. It's one of my kind of bugbears from reading other people's work. Um, I mean, the, for me, the, the the lowest common denominator is where you have the person who seems to speak English perfectly, but always says like "hello" and "thank you" in their own language. That's that's the one that I really can't stand. Um, but you you avoided that. Um, so so you mean like saying <laughs> "bonjour" and then then switching to English? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Else. I know, which kind of makes me cringe. Um, but you you didn't um, do that at all. Oh, good. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can't, I can't uh, remember. I, <laughs> I was I was kind of watching out for it. In fact, there was there was one there was one little bit uh, which I I th- not I think yes there was a little bit where, which uh, which you read out which is where um, Aunt Adele speaks in English and then the maid replies just in French um, which yeah you know which I thought was because obviously most people do know a little bit of French and they they will be able to figure out yes madame or something like that Um, yeah it it worked very well for me it seemed like you know there's a person on the train that serves her a cup of tea he speaks all in French so yeah it 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 worked for me and as you say the little the little sort of um, cues were there to to indicate to the reader, but it wasn't hitting you over the head with like, oh, look, now they're speaking French and right. they're, they're throwing in, you know, hello <laughs> and thank you and all that. Yeah. So milk or whiteness generally is um, a visual theme in several, throughout the book. Um, how did you decide on the imagery um, 
especially considering that the period setting demanded a great deal of imagination on your part already? Well, that the sea of milk comes from Hindu mythology, and it comes from the Hindu idea of what they call moksha, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is the Hindu version of nirvana. Um, and it's also uh, it's also the same sea that was churned by the gods and from which all creation uh, sprang. So it's sort of the primordial seas, you could say. So um, in my in my research, one of the things I did was I read just a lot about Hinduism. I'm not Hindu, so obviously I had to to do my homework and prepare, and I read a bunch of books and um, and so Hindu mythology does actually pop up in places that we, if we don't know Hinduism, may not recognize, but others might who, who do know Hinduism. And that would be an example of that. The Sea of Milk uh, is, is prominent in Hindu mythology. So, um, and that's all. And so it, it does come up in a couple other spots, like in the opening scene when the his, history turns over and becomes fictional is when Henri Mujo, the explorer, is dying of malaria and then he vomits up milk. Well, I was wondering whether that's that's really what happens. Actually. So I don't think I, I think it's safe to assume it's not oh, probably okay. not what happened. <laughs> uh, we don't have any videotape of it or recordings or the the two guides who are with him did not. Well, I mean, say I that, wondered if but, it was a general <laughs> symptom of, of malaria. But uh, in that case, it was supposed to. It, if if you recall, it had the brackish smell of the sea. Of the sea yeah. So. Um, so it was that is clearly me crossing over into to fiction and he hallucinates which in fact he did historically he did hallucinate and his last couple of entries were one sentence um entries of him hallucinating mm. uh so but then i just i, t- I took that and ran with it obviously mm. uh for me an- another recurring theme um was books um we've got uh muho's travelogue uh jackie's journal um, Frankenstein, uh, which the subtitle is Modern Prometheus, right? And Prometheus is also mentioned. Um, I wondered whether this was very deliberate on your part, whether you regard your novel as somewhat metafictional, um, because obviously you discovered uh, Muho's book, um, and then you chose to create a character who is familiar with the book and uses it as a means to discover her past um but you yourself are also using that book as as the writer i wonder uh, yeah i wonder what your thoughts are on that well his his journal was not fictional and so i, I don't know if i'd go so far as to consider mine metafictional but the the Fra- the frankenstein um book that is passed between them and briefly discussed I, I kept it in there. I was, I was tempted to cut it out, but I kept it in there because there is something allegorically valid about it, and that is is that throughout the the book, there's there's a, a conflict between science and 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 religion that, and faith that comes up quite a lot in the in the ninth, in the twentieth century story, and um and this is just after the Great War when science has maybe for the first time really shown how dark and evil and horrific it can become if used the wrong way and they're this they're just coming out of the wake of this there no one had any idea just how bad um, mankind could be in terms certainly in terms of scope in terms of how how far they could wreak horror and um and that kind of came through science and it's not a it's not my certainly not my criticism of science it's just to add to the tension in the story between science and faith um as uh, Jackie's foil and interest is is Victor who's a historical figure and he is coming from the other angle where he sees it really as just being uh nothing but good all the scientific developments so that's why the the Frankenstein um reference is is kept in there um as to why I felt inspired for Jackie to keep a, a, a journal, one of my uh, probably my my favorite book is by uh, an American author who not enough people know of, named Wallace Stegner. Do you know Wallace Stegner? I do not. <laughs> okay, well there you go. So Wallace Stegner won the Pulitzer Prize in 1972 for a book called Angle of Repose, and he it's a book that is is it's probably my favorite book, and he's probably my favorite author. Mm. Um, and that in that book, what he did is he somehow got a hold of a, a huge box of letters 
from the great grandmother of some friend about her um, her getting married and moving to the West, which was um, just developing at that time in the States, and her, a bit about their marriage and their um, their difficulties with getting different jobs and such. And and he actually included those letters in his um, in his novel. And if I remember right, I, I th- okay, so those letters were used as, as portraying the main character in it. So in my case, I thought it'd be fun. While I have some journal entries from Henri Muho that are used in there, I thought it would still be interesting to have Jackie write her own journal, just as he had done, which would make sense. I also thought it'd be a good way to get better inside her head so that the reader hopefully would understand her more and feel more empathy for her and connect with her better. So that's why I put that in there. It was kind of, in hindsight, it was actually quite a handful because you have to write in one style for the for the journal, um, another style for her story, and yet another style for the 13th century story. Mm. Um, and I approached them all differently, and that made it certainly more work to do. And I, I wouldn't recommend someone else do it, especially for their debut novel. <laughs> you mentioned um, that Hinduism plays a, a, a very important part of this book, and I wonder whether you would regard it as a spiritual book. Well, that's that's the, the biggest question right there. The, the, I would say um, it, it's absolutely, it's, the book is a struggle with spirituality and, and that is what is going on in the, the modern story. In the, in the ancient story, there's maybe a little bit of that, um, but otherwise it, it, the, the ancient story resigns itself to the superstitions of the day. Um, but the modern one struggles with that. The superstitions come back into the fore, but the the modern story does struggle with it. And there's characters who don't believe her um, or are not sure what to make of what she is experiencing. Uh, as she's, she's, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that, that, that reincarnation it comes, she's trying to figure this out. What is, what is going on? And, um, and there's a lot of disbelief there as well. So uh, I think in the in the end, there's a there there's it ends in a way that is supposed to um, be somewhat conclusive as to to where I think I'm coming from, and I don't want to give a spoiler too much and say too much about that because I think there there a lot of things are open ended. The reader can bring their own experiences to that, to where they're coming from spiritually, or if they're not spiritual at all, um, the same thing. So that that tension is there, that dynamic is there, uh, certainly played a big role in my life. Um, and this, I would say that this book was a way of me, uh, kind of working that out actually. Um, I think I'd worked it out intellectually. Um, but I also needed to work it out creative, creatively as well. And if anything, I would say that's what, um, that that's what this book is about actually mm. i think that part, i i wanted to ask you that question when i read um some of the the scenes um from the thir- 13th century cambodia section um he's i believe at one point he's meditating another point he goes to a the like a the forest of whispering bamboo if that's, I remember right. That right. that's right yeah. yeah correct and and the i just the the amount no, not the amount, but the, the the quality of the the detail I felt in those sections. It, made it, me... It's it, it completely signs on to the spiritual experience mm, for sure, yeah. um, and and it's beautiful, and it's beautiful. Um, but but in the modern story, Victor says, "Well, I think it's more a more poetic way to look at life." Yeah, but he doesn't sign on to it. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's where that's where the the con the the conflict i'd say arises in terms of the theme the spiritual theme mm. yeah sure let's have a another reading um and this time from that uh other um parallel narrative would you like to introduce it yes this so this is from paku's story the 13th century orphan and he uh, a miracle has taken place and in front of many people and in, including the queen, and he has been brought into the palace to be interviewed by her about it. 
She opened her mouth to speak, but nothing came out. Instead, she raised her hand and touched her lips. Her eyelids closed and her shoulders sank. Her eyes blinked back open and trained on him. I do not understand what happened today. Clearly it was a miracle of the gods and a very extraordinary one. Do you worship the god Balarama? No, I, I do not. Have you ever worshipped the god Balarama? No, I have not. You are not a monk? No, your highness. You never trained to be one? No, your highness. It was frightening to be this honest, but perhaps best to be quick about it, Paku thought. But your guardian is a monk. Is that not what he wanted for you? No, your highness. He has always given me the freedom to do as I wish. He is also Vishnuite? Yes, your highness. Is he the man who waits for you outside the palace walls? Surprised, concerned, Paku nodded. He had been thinking only of his own vulnerability. His closest companions were out there on the palace grounds, torches lit on them, guards surrounding them. Have you been fasting? No, your highness. With increasing frustration, she asked, but did you even pray before the miracle? No, your highness. She put a hand upon her heart. It faintly rose and fell with her breathing. She said, but you are a pious man. You do worship the gods. Paku thought it over, because this is where it all hung. Had she not been a queen, had he not been poised here on his knees in this abyss of purple, weapons unseen trained on him, on his loved ones, he might have debated the gods here. He might have launched into that all-night conversation. Yes, your highness, he finally said. I show my respect to the gods. But how then did you prepare? In truth, I did nothing. I believe sometimes the gods work whether children of the sun are prepared or not. Her high arched brows tightened. She accepted the answer reluctantly. Were you intoxicated today? she asked. His face went slack. He answered, Yes, Your Highness. Paku of the village of the Lotuses, we need to understand the meaning of this miracle. It is imperative to do so. A great miracle is a sign from the gods, and we must understand what it is they want us to do. But this this is very perplexing. You are a surprising choice. Up in the corner, a shadow moved behind the wooden filigree screen. Paku returned his gaze to the queen, but found himself glancing back at it. He almost didn't realize it when the queen abruptly arose. To his shock, she crossed the carpet toward him. The guards rustled uneasily. Something stirred in Paku's belly. Belly thoughts, like a rat wanting to chew its way out. Everything about this felt wrong. She sat on a hip, folded her legs in, and supported herself with an arm. Eyes wide, she leaned in and asked, Are you an incarnation of Balarama? Paku wanted to move away. It took every muscle to hold himself in place. No, your highness, I am Paku of the village of the lotuses. I harvest lotus tea. I was raised by a Vishnuite monk. I am not an incarnation of Balarama. She studied each of his eyes, searching the validity of his words. Do you know if Balarama will come to our kingdom again? she asked. I wouldn't know, your highness. The queen's voice echoed louder off the chamber walls. You have been used for an extraordinary miracle. You must tell us everything you know. Help us to understand what the gods want us to do. Her eyes darted over his shoulder. Someone neared. Paku spied a dark old priest with a walking cane moving along the wall, closing in on their conversation. He only wore a loincloth. It was Harishikesha, the chief priest, Raj Guru to the king and mentor to Jerisi. Queen Devi asked with a new voice, gentle as a wooden flute, Paku, have the gods ever used you for a miracle before? Paku dropped his head and hid his eyes. This was unexpected. He heard Jerisi's voice in his head proclaiming the miraculous recovery of the monkey, his belief that Paku had special gifts from the gods. Paku recalled the sensation when he made the cow dust clay for Uchi, the surging feeling that he had the power, in fact, to prevent death. But he couldn't say whether or not any of it was true. The Rajguru, now at the edge of the carpet, leaned forward, his better ear cocked outwards. Paku glanced up at the queen, eyes hurrying across her face, searching for a hint of guidance, but found he couldn't hold her charcoal gaze. His eyes roved. He remained mute. 
"'You have been asked a question by the royal queen,' said an age-cracked voice. "'You are obliged to answer and to answer truthfully. "'Have the gods ever used you for a miracle before?' "'Paku glanced over at the Rajguru. "'He had never seen the emaciated old man up close "'and felt unnerved by the sight. "'Like a feather, the coolest of fingers touched his chin. "'It guided his face back to hers. "'Her deep eyes were trustworthy. "'Indeed, there was something comforting in them, almost familiar.' She had what Paku imagined to be a mother's touch. Perhaps, he answered. Let's look a little bit at the uh, sort of nitty-gritty side of things, the the writing and the publishing. Um, you, you mentioned the, the amount of re- uh, research that you did. Um, I mean, how did you approach that? Was it literally a matter of sort of going to the library and sitting down with one of those green lamps and a, a big pile of books next to you? Uh, well, I did order some some books, uh, but in terms of libraries, my, my library experience was more interesting than that. I, I got a, um, I wanted to to figure out if this French archaeological project. I want to get more information about it. And I couldn't find it online at all. In fact, I couldn't even find out if it still existed or not, or if it was in Siem Reap. So I got in a plane. I flew over to to Siem Reap. And I didn't know how I was going to re- do my research. I, I tried to prepare in advance, but I came up with nothing. So I got there and I hired a kid to drive me around on the back of his moped. Who, and he was very confused because he kept wanting to take me to the temples. And, and instead I told him I wanted to go to a library. Mm. And um, so eventually he took me to this tiny library uh, where I went in there and I asked him if they had any books about um, the, the French school, the Far East. And they said, well, why don't you just drive down the street and go there yourself? And I said, well, you mean it still exists? And they said, yeah, it's just right down the road. Go there. <laughs> and I said, really? And so they, 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 gave, they, they told me how to get there. And so I hopped back on the, the moped with this kid. And, um, and so we went past it a couple of times and found it. And, um, and it was just kind of a state and I went to the office and there was a French lady there and there was a, a tiny, very tiny library behind her. And I said, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book and I'm looking for some information. And do you mind if, uh, can I look through your library? It was all in French, which was, um, not a bit of a struggle, but, um, but I said also, is there anyone I can interview about, about, um, the, the project. And she said, well, um, let me see. And she got on the phone with the director who said, well, give me a couple hours and I'll be down there. Mm. So a couple hours later, he, com- he comes down and, and we, we sit outside. And of course, he, he pulls out a cigarette, starts smoking and says, uh, look, I, w- I was not alive during this time. I, I don't know if I can answer your questions. I, I, just don't, I don't know if I can really help you. So I said, well, okay, well, first of all, I, I'm just wondering if um, where would have the project been back then, back in, 19, in 1920? Was it across from, was it across the moat? Was it, how close was it to the temple? And he said, well, you are looking at it. This is it. This is, this is the project right here. This is the same building. This is the same, this is the same estate. And I, I, was, I was amazed by that. And so, of course, I, 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 that helped me visually quite a lot in terms of what to write about. Um, and he was actually a, a reluctant gold mine. He, he helped a lot, mm. um, answered a lot of questions as to what the project would have been busy doing and what the director would have been busy with. And... Um, so that turned out to that trip there was a success just because of that one interview alone. Um, and then otherwise, yeah, on the on the Internet and ordering books, some of the books are hard to find. So I had to order them like that one by the French emissary, uh, by the Chinese emissary. Uh, I had to, to order that book. Uh, Henri Mujo's journals of when he was traveling. I had to order those from a small publisher in Thailand, actually, to get those. They're not right. easy. They're not easy to find. Um, so that's how I that. Yeah, that's how I, I set out. Um, I thought they might have been on um, uh, Project Gutenberg, because because you mentioned that those they are public domain. Yeah. Yes, they are. Um, but they're public. They're probably pub. They're public domain, but they might be. It's a question of finding the translations into English, um, which turned out to be the small friend, the small publisher mm. in in Thailand. Mm. Actually, interesting. And then, okay, so you've uh, so you've done your research. I mean, did you did you continue? Did you start writing while you were researching, or did you try and get most of that done and then start writing? How, no, I how was I was writing while I was researching for sure, and I was figuring out a lot as I was writing. I did not 
I did not really come up with a, a planned uh, a, a plot that I figured out clearly in advance. I was figuring out as I went along. I think I think it was John Banville that had had who had said that um, he knows a reader would not be able to figure out where his stories are going because he doesn't know where mm-hmm. his stories are going yeah. when he sets out to write them. And so I didn't uh, I didn't go crazy with with trying to sketch out the, the architecture of the book. I just would write, I would research, I would fix, I would edit. I probably, I would probably do things a bit differently next time around. I'd probably at least try to come up with a quick rough draft first and then, then go back and keep making it better. In, in the case of The Last Gods, I was actually doing a sub- substantial amount of revising and editing as I was going along. And that's another reason why I was going so slowly. Mm. And it took me a long time to write it because I get kind of stuck in my editing before I could move on with it. Yeah. You, I mean, I just looking at your bio, you said it took you the best part of a decade to... to yeah, if you, if you include the final tweaks that the, the publisher and I did on it before um, we, we, we said, okay, we're, we're done, um, I think it would have been almost 12 years, in right. fact, yeah, including those final tweaks. But yeah. I, would say, I would say it was about four years before I thought I had a completed novel, and then a couple more years of very substantial revisions and editing. And then for the years after that, I would say I would put it down for a couple of months and then pick it back up and... Um, and go through it again, give it another pass. Mm. And, I, and I was still getting some feedback at that point um, still. And I would still make tweaks. And, then, and, if you, and I'd also still inject stuff into it at that time, even after years of, of, it, of thinking that it was done. I was still adding. And eventually you do that over a long period of time. The advantage of writing one story over a long period of time, especially if it's historical fiction, is that means you have all the more time to keep putting stuff back in, in terms of information and details of tightening the plot, of fixing weaknesses. And so um, there is there is definitely an upside to really taking your time to mm. finish to, to finishing your book, and especially if it's your first one. Yeah, I really got a... a f- a really strong feeling of that i i felt that everything was very purposeful um all of the information and the scenes that you included were all very purposeful if there's one thing that really bugs me in in the stuff that i read it's stuff that just feels like it's kind of there because you want to make up the word count or it's just because you feel that you've got to have a certain amount of time passing i didn't feel that at all with with mm. last gods that's good we're going to talk a little bit more about the editing uh later in the masterclass so let's skip ahead to publishing the road to publishing the road to publishing well this this is where things got a bit crazy i was actually i think about maybe six years not even six years into it when um i had gone to a a breakfast um a brunch I think by the Hong Kong Literary Festival, whereas few industry people were talking. Mm. One of them was the the chairman of um, Macmillan Asia. And he had said, you know, I always think that as, as much as people send uh, manuscripts through the mail, you know, it always leaves more of an impression if you could actually hand it in person than, than the the agent or may or the publisher may they'll have you in mind and they may have a better reference when they pick it up and et cetera. And so I remember that. So a year later or more, I decide to call him up and I call his secretary and I can't get through. So a month or two later, I call again. I can't get through. I do this again and again. And then one day I get through mm. and he picks up and I said, hi, um, I heard you speak at a brunch uh, a year and a half ago and you had said, suggest you had given the advice to hand over a manuscript in person. So I would, I was hoping to take you up on your own advice to deliver my manuscript to you. (laughs) And he laughed at me and said, uh, okay, okay. All right, fine. Um, and so we made an appointment, whereas I thought I was going to just drop it off in the lobby, maybe meet him for a couple of minutes, Mm. um, as so that, you know, he's just going to be polite. 
so, but anyway, he actually took me in, um, took me into this large meeting room for Macmillan Asia that overlooks the harbor and, and sits me down and asks me about what I wrote. And I, and he said, well, what kind of audience would it be for? And I, I mentioned uh, the book that we, I talked about before, The Piano Tuners, the mm. historical fiction book set in Burma. Well, what I didn't know is that Macmillan's imprint, Picador, which happens to be my favorite publisher, um, was 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 his was their imprint. I didn't I didn't put I didn't connect that. Mm. And he said, "Well, in fact, actually, we're looking for a book to 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 fill the market left by the piano tuner that mm. was, which was a bestseller." And he definitely sat up in his chair when I started talking about the book. The setting was right. And actually, I have to say, when I set out to write this book, I did know that I did know that that there was not enough literature written about um, about Anchor Watt mm. and that there was a hole there in, in, the, in the market. And so he sat up in his chair and I handed him whatever 40 pages and then I left a bit, a little bit, uh, a, a, little, a little bit frazzled because I wasn't expecting that much uh, of his time mm. or to be asked a lot of questions about it. And to be taken seriously. Mm. In fact, I just thought this is kind of crazy, but you know, what the hell? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I left, and then a few days later, over the weekend, he sends me an email and says, "Can I have the electronic version of the whole thing?" And I said, "Okay." And so I sent off the electronic version, and then um, a, a couple weeks later, he said, "May I have the the whole version in paper form?" And he said, "I'm going to take it to London with me." Um, and I said, "Okay." And so I, I sent that off, or I delivered it to his secretary or whatever. And, uh, and then I knew I was being taken very seriously, of mm. course. And he said that. He said, I'm going to present it to Picador. Um, and uh, so that was a big deal. So that summer, I also went off to study writing at, at, for a couple of weeks at the Iowa Summer Writing Festival. And, um, and, I, and I hadn't heard back from him in a few months. It had been a few months. And... I was out uh, having some drinks with some of the other fellow students, and I told them this story, and I said, oh, you know, I, I'm learning so much here, and I'm realizing, you know, things that I just wasn't doing right in my manuscript, and, oh, I wish I could do it again, and this, look, I had this opportunity, and I never heard back, and I was lamenting uh, this this loss of a, of a great opportunity. Well, Anyway, I was in I was in the states, obviously, and someone had been trying to call me, and I didn't know who, and I couldn't for whatever reasons I couldn't get the the message while I was in the states, but someone had been trying to call me many times, and it was a number I didn't recognize. So the next morning after this conversation, I opened my email, um, and it said it says hi, uh, I'm so and so. I've been assigned to your book. Um, I'd like to meet you in person I'm with with uh, with Macmillan. I'd like to meet you in person to talk about it. Mm. And I, I said, oh, OK. Um, and uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I, I'll be back in Hong Kong. So let's meet when I, when I come back to Hong Kong. So I came. So, of course, I was very thrilled. And a lot of things were happening actually kind of fast. Uh, one of my teachers there in Iowa found out about that. And then she wanted to introduce me to her agent who was the same agent as for Cormac McCarthy and Tony Morrison and stuff. And I didn't re So then I was in contact with that agent for a while, which is very intense. And, and then I was coming back to Hong Kong and I was meeting with this guy and he wanted to make a handshake shake deal saying, look, this is probably going to happen. Um, but just we all we ask is that you don't talk to other, you don't show this to other publishers right mm. now. And, um, and then it was very easy to get an agent in the UK shortly thereafter. Um, and it was fun because I didn't have to go through that whole slog of the 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 unsolicited query letter to hundreds of, of publishers. Instead, I just sent out a, a basically a one sentence message to maybe twenty or less agents in the UK saying, "This is what's going down on Monday. This chairman is this chair is the CEO is showing my manuscript to the board, the editorial board of Picador. I have no agent." Bye. <laughs> and I started getting phone calls within an hour or two. Um, so that was really fun. Mm. And, I, and I could talk. I could, the story of this is actually quite long. But in the end, this actually happened to be the 2000. Uh, well, what happened is this was the middle of uh, the 2008 financial crisis. Mm. So I, I didn't get that deal. Um, and I was told uh, that the, the crisis and the closure of Barnes & Noble in excuse me, of, uh, uh, 
of uh, borders, the closure of, of is that it? Of borders in the states just changed the industry entirely, and they're afraid of new authors, blah blah blah, and they decided not to to go forward with it. Um, and there was a lot of substantial publishing people involved, um, and uh, at the at the time, and so I was I was devastated by that. In hindsight, I have to say that I know it was not ready. Mm. I know it was not ready. And when that agent, uh, the, the agent of the famous authors and, and I were in touch, I got back basically from Iowa. I, I was went to San Francisco to see my family. And, and then she said, look, I'll read it this weekend. And I, I thought, oh, my God, I just learned all this new stuff in Iowa. I have to give another revision. So I spent a few days frantically revising it. I sent it to her with a lot of trepidation. And, um, and she didn't take it. And I'm not surprised. Like there was obviously things going for the book that it solicited that kind of interest, mm-hmm. and uh, but in hindsight there was things that were not there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think probably in terms of, of characterization, maybe somewhat in terms of the prose, um, and things that needed to be improved. It was it had not arrived yet, so that that it's interesting because those were doors that were opened too early. Um, I think there's these things like the law of attraction that says, no, you get an opportunity, you jump on it and the universe will fall into place. No, this is, I need a time machine <laughs> because the, and then, uh, uh, later on a year later, um, I got, uh, there was an auction for it in the UK, which also didn't quite pan out. Well, it didn't pan out. And again, I, it was, the manuscript was not ready. And so we can talk about that more in terms of, of ed, the editing process because it's very difficult to um, to get it there. So what happened is, uh, yeah, it it uh, I, I had I had this agent in the UK who put it up for auction. Um, she was extremely excited, enthusiastic about it, and we did have a couple of the major publishers who. Um, who asked for an extension to consider it, which was nice. But eventually they backed out, although one did come back and kept asking about it. Mm. Um, so uh, then what happened is when the Man Asian Literary Prize started up here in Hong Kong, it was originally for unpublished works. And so I just went ahead and sent it in. Okay. And um, and as fate would have it, they actually long listed it, which was great. And so once again, I started getting more un, un, some unsolicited emails and I got one from an agent in New York um, and so I ended up uh, because these options in the UK had seemed to be to have been exhausted I, I ended up going with his agent in New York to present it in New York I'm not entirely sure what went down there um, but again it didn't happen so uh, and this all these processes take a long time the UK one took a, a I don't know a year and a half the, the New York one took another year and a half and um, and then, uh, and then there was a, a publisher, and after that, there was a, a publisher in Hong Kong who was extremely interested, but they were not publishing fiction anymore. And then they decided, well, okay, we'll use this book to get back into fiction because we, we really believe in it. And then eventually they decided no, and that whole process took up another year and a half. Mm. And um, but anyway, all the while I wasn't I wasn't despairing and I wasn't giving up. I, the, it was not actually collecting dust on the shelf. In fact, I was actually going back to it, mm. and I would improve it every time. I'd always ask questions. I would always go back and tweak things. And every few months I would, I would do it again because I, I still believed in, in this book. I didn't think okay, I have to leave this and go to my next book. I know, I was like, no, I believe in this. So, um, and fortunately, there was another publisher in Hong Kong who was very much still fighting the good fight of fiction. And um, and so they took it, uh, they took it very quickly after I approached them. And, but with the caveat that their, their list for the next, the following year was already full and therefore I was going to have to wait extra long for its publication and um so that what was supposed to be over like a year and a half wait ended up being over two years of right. waiting for it to actually get out there but again i still would go back and tweak it up until they said okay um, enough's enough mm. and um and and then and now it's out there and and it has been rewarding that the reviews have been um, really good and the feedback's been good it's been a fun journey to get it out there um, 
So, but it was quite a long journey, and I'm just telling you the the, the, the short version. I mean, I could tell you about each <laughs> about each of these <clears throat> steps, the agents, or the. Um, I could I could tell a long story about about each of those experiences. In fact, yeah, and it's published by Signal Eight. Signal Press. Eight Press here in Hong Kong. That's right, yeah. and who uh, publishes fiction, and they're very much still 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 fighting the good fight of fiction, which we we need more of. Um, because there's too many publishers out there who are, who have given up on fiction. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. And where can we get a copy of it? The the easiest way to get a copy of it is ordering it through Amazon um, or the book depository. It depends on your location. If you're if you're in the states or the UK, Amazon's probably the easiest vendor. There's other vendors out there. Any online vendor should have it. Uh, if you're in Australia or Hong Kong, um, well, if you could order it uh, at probably the book depository is the easiest who has um, sort of free shipping. Uh, if you're in Hong Kong, also um, the bookazine in Prince Ed, and the Prince's building in Central is carrying it. Um, but that's, yeah, that's really the, the easiest way to order it. Of course, there's also a Kindle version, which is... Um, which is the easiest way to have it delivered through yeah. through the internet, of course. Sure. Blah.
This is Gillian Bickley and Werner Bickley of Proverse Hong Kong. And you're listening to the Hong Kong Writers Circle podcast. The writing masterclass for this episode is how to edit your manuscript. And uh, Sam, I believe that you have come prepared with five top tips about this. That's right. I'm, I actually consider myself more of an editor than a writer. Uh, and I think... I don't think my my ta- any so-called talent for writing is, is is something that I particularly have as much as it is just an obsessiveness for editing, and I am obsessive about editing when it comes to music or um, or writing. I can do it for a long, long time. I can put a lot of time into it, and 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 I, it's easy for me to do that. Um, so so in terms of coming up with five points of of uh, advice for editing one is very obvious but i'd like to talk about it more and maybe it's something about it will sound fresh the obvious thing is just to get feedback and get more and, and actually just keep repeat doing it until you can't get any more uh, it ha- when i was starting on this manuscript i happened to be going to work on the ferry here in hong kong and i was talking to a colleague and we we're talking about alternate um, universes where we would be doing something else and and she had mentioned oh i think i'd like to be an editor and I said, oh, well, really, I, th- I think I'd like to be a writer. Would you like to read something that I've been working on? And, and so she, she agreed um, to read uh, the first few chapters of what I was working on the, for the rough draft. And she ripped it to shreds. She even, used a, she, she even used a red pen. So when I got it back, it was, it was just like this punch in the stomach. You just see your page bleeding <laughs> from flagellation of, um, from the editor. And, I always use but, a blue pen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very nice. <laughs> Aren't you sweet? Um, but she used a red pen, and it was bleeding, and it was painful. But it was good. And, um, and it was always, why are you using this? Why are you using that? What, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do this. Uh, and that was very useful. Um, and then I had another friend reading who was asking more questions about character. The next thing I did was I joined the Hong Kong Writer Circle, which was uh, easily one of the smartest things I did for, for learning how to write. And I joined two different workshopping groups, and, um, they, and they tend to fizzle out. And uh, as um, people, I think, become maybe discouraged or whatever, uncommitted. But at the end of the day, one group, two of those uh, fellow writers went made it through the entire manuscript over a span of maybe two years. And the, another one from the other group made it through also probably uh, over the span of maybe two years or so as I was working on it and, and still writing. Um, and I, that was hugely beneficial. I learned a tremendous amount from them. Um, as I mentioned before, I spent a summer where I went to Iowa and took some classes at the, the festival there. Again, um, I learned an incredible amount. And also, you have, to, you have to maximize every experience you have. So when I went to Iowa, I sought out the best students from those classes. And I said, would you consider re- continuing to read my, my material after this is over? And um, one of them was kind of said, well, yeah, okay. And she didn't. But another one did mm. and um, read about maybe two-thirds of the book and had a lot of input, a lot of create, creative ideas. And... and um, you go to those people, go to the, go to the ones who, you know, really know what they're doing and keep soliciting the advice. Um, if I can insert another little plug here for the writer's circle is that we have now established a, a beta readers group, which is exactly for reading whole pieces. Uh, and you earn credits to have your piece read by reading other people's pieces. And then, um, and then once you've earned enough and depending on how long your, your, piece of work is then you can have somebody sit down read the whole thing and then write a report um, for it at the end that's fantastic yeah that's fantastic so that, so, that follows on from the critique groups that you were part of because that, that's something that we have that the critique groups are, are really great if you're writing short fiction but if you really do want to get somebody if you want to get feedback on your entire novel it can take a very long time and as you say people move away from hong kong and things so, sure but so, there's, yeah. there's also other elements involved um that i wanted to mention uh, is that uh is that it's always difficult to take the criticism. And I, I, and I realized that some people were falling out of the groups because they were folding 
under the criticism. They couldn't take it. And uh, and other people have asked me to read their stuff and have even said in advance, oh, don't be too hard on me. And I always find that very surprising. Now, as a classical musician, we are we are trained to put ourselves in front of other people and to be always getting critical feedback. If you're preparing for an audition, the best the, the first thing you should do is play in front of your colleagues and have them uh, tear you down mm. and critique it. And, and then you have to try and build yourself up. But you have to always believe in that you have to know what that process is and and sign yourself on to it and as a classical musician that's exactly what we do so i already had that mentality when i came to workshopping and getting critique with writing so i knew even as hard as it was or if I, my feel, my ego was bruised i always knew that was part of the process and so i didn't give up mm. and what was surprising to me is to see other writers give up like they actually would prefer not to get critical feedback mm. than um than to get it and and feel like feel like crap afterwards mm. it's interesting because for me in my profession as a teacher we have the same thing we have observations which can be horrible and terrible and and yeah you you have to with the report afterwards yeah, right? with, a, yeah. with somebody sitting there writing and then you do something <laughs> and then they put their head down and they start writing and sure think, oh, right, God, right. What have I done? <laughs> yeah and it's it, and it's really hard but if you can if you can just accept it and then take it and then learn from it then right. it can be very positive but it's, very positive it's, essential it's essential because you can't you cannot be good at this if you're not first bad at it and and that and it's just like music or anything else you have to go you have to go through that process the difference is that as music maybe okay you're a beginner when you're a kid um, but and writing is something that we usually don't take to seriously until maybe adulthood and so we and that and that's uh, kind of a ironically kind of a vulnerable time to do it because adults egos are much bigger than a kids so uh, so they get the criticism they fold um, or they don't want it anymore or they decide no I'm gonna go my I'm gonna go my own way I'm gonna develop my own style and they become too reclusive they don't get the feedback and then lo and behold they have these not these books they've written and you know what they're they're not all that good um because they they just they just shied away from from mm. the criticism of, of workshopping yeah and unless you're franz kafka i don't think you can make that work <laughs> yeah i mean you have to i think over time you get better at it i think but i think especially for your first public first published novel um you really need it because you can write a novel and then another one and another one and actually maybe be learning things along the way but you could also be doing all the wrong, all the, a lot of wrong stuff along the way too and just be continuing the same habits because you're not you're not paying your dues in the workshops mm. so uh the fir my first advice is you have to pay your dues in the workshops and if you're here in Hong Kong you have to join the Hong Kong writer circle to do that because that's that is the um, the best tool we have here in Hong Kong for that. And it's what I needed. The Last Gods of Industry would not be what it is without the Hong Kong Writer's Circle, for sure. That's very kind of you to say. It's true. What's your tip number two? Tip number two, moving on. How to tackle overwriting. Uh, this is just a few random ideas. Um, it, it kind of relates to what I was talking about as a musician. As musicians, what we do as well is that you you record yourself practicing a lot and you go back and listen to it and the phenomenon is that as a teacher explained to me once that when you when you're playing you don't hear yourself the same way as when you hear yourself recording record it same thing with singing for example you sing one way if you record yourself and listen to it it's going to be a very very different experience and that's all in you're going back and reflecting upon a, a moment in real time R writing is not unlike that when you when you write and when you read your own writing, you're not doing it with the same eyes as someone else who is reading it for the first time and who is not you. Um, and so what you do as a musician when you're recording yourself and listening to yourself, you do that again and again and again over a long period of time. And eventually that gap between your um, real time experience and what it actually sounds like in the recording narrows and narrows and narrows until it becomes more honest. And um, and so that's your goal 
with uh, with writing as well, and 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 specifically in tackling overwriting because that's the tendency that we, we all have, especially um, especially in the in the beginning when when one is trying to be super creative and inventive. Um, so what a, a few things I just wrote down about that about overwriting, uh, you know, don't fall in in love too much with your own sentences. It's a it's a virtual guarantee. <laughs> that you will be loath to chopping that up when someone else says this doesn't work. Um, and the more in love you are with your own sentences, the less likely you, you are to see what's actually wrong with it. Um, so, uh, you know, adverbs, be very careful with adverbs. Usually what, when you want to use an adverb, the, the, the context is already there um, so, that, so that using the adverb is probably redundant um, are, are, are repetitive, even if it hasn't been explicitly said uh, in the sentence or the paragraph. If the scene kind of implies it, then you you probably nine times out of ten you don't need that adverb. And that's to a lesser extent. You even need to be true. Um, you need to address that with adjectives too. Just be careful with it. Don't don't go crazy with your adjectives if it's implied within the context of the the paragraph or the scene that you're your um, writing, then you probably don't need that. In fact, these days, the um, I'm going to read a, a paragraph out of uh, Elena Ferrante's um, first book of the Neapolitan series. If I can, if I can find it, what she's very, uh, very, very popular these days, and. Um, She's very popular these days, and I and I went to Italy last. I went to Italy last fall and wanted to read something Italian, so I picked up this book that 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 everyone is talking about this series, and she, one of her characters is a writer. It's a, it's the best friend of the main character who has a a really good, uh, a, a, a excellent gift for writing, um, and the character the the main character reflects on this while uh, reflects on her writing style. And I realize as I'm reading this clearly, this is, this is clearly Ferrante's um, statement about what she likes about writing, clearly, and what she, how she presumably feels about her own writing style, mm. which is interesting. So I'm just, this is short. I'm going to read it. Here's what it, sa- here's what it says. <clears throat> unlike me when I wrote, unlike Saratore and his articles and poems, unlike even many writers I had read and was reading, she expressed herself in sentences that were well constructed and without air, even though she had stopped going to school. But further, she left no trace of effort. You weren't aware of the artifice of the written word. I read and I saw her. I heard her. The voice set in the writing overwhelmed me, enthralled me even, even more than when we talked face to face. It was completely cleansed of the dross of speech, of the confusion of the oral. It had the vivid orderliness that I imagined would belong to conversation if one were so fortunate as to be born from the head of Zeus and not from the Grecos or the Cerios. I was ashamed of the childish pages I had written to her, the overwrought tone, the frivolity, the false cheer, the false grief. That's kind of Fronte's... Uh, Mantra. I think it's kind of it's quite bold of her to put it in her own book. Um, it's uh, it yeah, it's it's uh, a bit courageous of her to do. Now, having said that, clearly what she's talking about is is uh, not not overriding. Now, having said that, um, having said that, I just want to briefly say that as much as I enjoyed this book, was happy to read it. I'm curious as to where the characters are going to go. Uh, for me. This style of writing, of which there are many great writers, is what I would kind of consider to be the dry style. It goes so much for clarity um, that I wish it would push the prose more with uh, either being metaphorical or allegorical, or whatever. Uh, I, 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 like, I like to read where the writer is pushing the creative process some. And finding that balance between where they're pushing it and you're you're fascinated by it, you think it's clever or you think it's beautiful, or versus being overwritten, that's a very gray area. And that is pushed around a lot by different tastes. Now, at the end of the day, I prefer to write in a way that suits my own taste. So I'm not going to go for 
what I consider to be the dry writing. I understand why they do it. They do it because they feel that it, it, it flows so quickly and it doesn't get in the way of the characters and it keeps the focus on the character, really it keeps the focus on the characters or the plot. Mm. I understand that. But for me, I like sitting with writing where the, the writer's making more of an effort. But hopefully, as she just said, you don't see that effort. Hopefully it doesn't sound, mm. hopefully you don't see the sweat of the author on the pages. So it still needs to, to, to flow. And yet I, I like a bit of a push. So when, I, when we talk about editing and stuff, you can see here I have a, a, at the back of uh, you, Simon, can see that I have a couple of notes here, but I didn't actually uh, take many notes when I was reading and enjoying her book. And by contrast, I brought, uh, to show you, I brought another book. This is by another author who, is, who isn't too well known, named Naeem Murr, who a, a poet gave to me. It's called The Perfect Man. Mm. And I didn't know anything about it when I read it. Um, for the first time. And it ended up being one of, I'd say, maybe five novels that I studied the most um, as a writer. And here's what the back looks like. Oh, wow. After, uh, there's the back <laughs> cover, the opening pages, um, pages and pages. Actually, I ran out of, whoops, okay, there's more there, of my notes. And what, what we're looking at here is my micro writing yeah, um, tiny, it's, it's, tiny writing filling up the, the end super, pages in, super, in the margins. Yeah, it, it's it's really small, almost illegible, and it's of my notes from reading him. And uh, some of these are quotes, actually, and uh, of just a sentence that, that he wrote that I thought was so brilliant, I just wanted to go back to it and revisit it. Um, others are just where his creatively creativity stimulated my creativity. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, okay, well, my mind takes that sentence actually goes off in this direction and then that's where I start coming up with my own prose by by studying and reading other people and this was an example of something that really stimulated me um, other books that come to mind that did that were as I said before Wallace Stegner's Angle of Repose um, the, the God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy um, there's a couple others but uh, there's other authors who push it more than than um, Ferrante does in the other vein. Cormac McCarthy is another example, another one of my favorite authors. His his early stuff is is pretty extreme. So so you take a book like Blood Meridian. Wow, the first two pages, I, I read it and I just thought, what? Oh, huh? Mm -hmm. I, I read it. I stopped myself, read it again, and thought, whoa. And then I read it a third time and thought, oh, my God, uh, this is kind of incredible. Yeah. And and he, by the time he got to the road, many, many, many years later, his his uh, style evened out quite a lot. He he wrote the road, I think, in three weeks, and um, he was not pushing his prose very hard, and so it makes for a very much more easy read. Um, but having said that, as much as I enjoy his re his his writing, and and, I, and, I, and it challenges me and it pushes me in a way that I love, I wouldn't say that I felt empathetic with his characters. Um, in fact, I would say I was more interested in Ferrante's characters mm. than, than his, but he pushes me more as a writer, mm. for sure. And, um, and so I'm more interested in studying him. Uh, and if I have leisurely time to read, then I might be more interested in reading, reading her. So that, um, that brings me to another point, which was uh, don't just read, study. You know, one of the quotes that, that uh, the teacher at Iowa gave me, told us was daytime is for writing nighttime is for study and, and reading alone doesn't count as study if i'm listening to music that doesn't count as an influence to my songwriting unless i'm actually analyzing well what, what are the harmonies here how are they doing what they're they do that i like what what what's the nitty-gritty behind this i have to figure out why it sounds appealing to me and that's the same thing with writing um you i can enjoy ferrante but but it's really studying the others that push me, like McCarthy or like um, here with Na Naeem Murr in this book, The Perfect Man. Uh, and, and study, you're recording, you're taking notes, you're, you're figuring out. The question you should always be asking is, how is this writer doing writing a sentence that is differently than how I would have written the, sim the same thing? Yeah. And then you try to figure out how you can, you can mold your writing into different ways. And then it becomes more... Um, 
it becomes more professional. And eventually when you get these different influences in terms of your own voice, that's when you kind of establish your own voice. But you first have to understand how voices work before you establish your own voice. You don't just sit down, write, and say, this is my own voice, because it's probably not going to make sense that anyone else is reading it other than you, who, of course, loves it to death. Mm. But everyone else will read it and might say, huh, what, what is this? So, so you have to really study how other people do things, take notes, and then when, you, and it, when it stimulates your prose, you inject that prose back into your own manuscript. You can record ideas for prose while into your, the microphone on your phone. You can write stuff down on your phone even um, as you're just collecting it, as you're whatever, walking down the street, which happened with to me many times. And you can go back and just keep injecting that into your edits as you go back and find a place for it. Um, in, in terms of my own prose, uh, which I, I did push, I think, as in the objective scheme of things, I would say it's probably pushed a bit more hard than other writers. I hope I struck the right balance. Um, a lot of those ideas came after I'd written the book. And I thought, where could this go? And then I think, ah, yes, it mm. could go there. It would fit nicely there. And this could fit nicely there. And this could fit nicely there. And I honestly, if you do that over some years, you end up with something that's I th hopefully kind of rich. I mean, only the reader can decide if I was successful or not with that. So so the other the, the point I was making this just then is is don't just read study and that will affect how you go back and edit it. Um, I have another um, example of that, something that I've discovered recently, which is a little it comes from screenwriting more than um, prose writing. But um, uh, it's a person uh, that I discovered through YouTube who has um, developed a it's called the story clock notebook, something like that. And it's where you write out the beats or the important events of a story on a clock and the sort of the, the 12 o'clock mark is the end of the story and then you, you can divide up your clock into the sort of three acts if it's a film or, or whatever. Um, but it, it's in two parts. So the first part is where you take films that you have watched and enjoyed and or know to be good and analyse them and write them out on the story clock and look at how things work and how things are right. set up and how things are paid off. So that's the study part. And then the second half... Um, of the book is where you the notebook is where you put in your own stories or films or, or whatever um, and and do it for yourself so so there is the same thing it's the very clear distinction between studying and, and learning you know the way that it has been done and then doing it for yourself um, and in my recent editing that I've done for the new anthology that's coming up I have written story clocks for other people and I said this is what your story looks like at the moment and this is how I think you could consider setting some things up. And right. you, you notice here that there's not much happening for this part of the clock. So you, right. maybe you want to put in a bit more here. Right. Um, but yeah, definitely the, the distinction between yes, yeah, reading for reading and reading for study. I think it, is writing, writing is a craft. It's not, it's not just a, a talent. And people talk about talent too much. Music is a craft. You, spent, you, you spend your hours on the violin doing it again and again and again because it, it's a craft and the, and the trap that writers can fall into that's unlike music is that if you if if you're a musician you decide not to, to actually study the violin but you're going to just play with it a lot there's zero chance you can get in front of other people and think it's and they'll think it's any good you have got to pay your dues and get proper study to learn that craft. Mm. Now, the, the trap with writing is that you can, people know how to speak, so, mm. and they know how to write. After all, they're, they're literate and mm. they went to school, so, th so they think they can write, but they're not willing to, to do the, the, the study and get to critique. Yeah. And so, they, 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 so then they, they don't do that, and then they put it out there, which is no different than a violinist who's never taken lessons and saying, well, I've been working hard on this um, song I wrote, and now I want you all to hear it. It's not. Yeah. It's it's just not going to work. You, yeah. you really you really need that feedback, and only after you've done it a long time, then maybe you know you're in a place where you that gap is closed between what you read and what someone else is going to yeah. read. I completely agree, and I, in fact, I've tried to remove the word talent or talented from my day-to-day -day vocabulary i'm not big on talent at all. yeah i and and the music example is such a good one and i and i remember um that it's 
I was listening to a program or something, and someone said that it's it especially affects um, musicians uh, from minority musicians, you know, black musicians, for example. They say, "Oh, he's a very talented um, player." And the example that they used was Miles Davis, and talking about how Miles Davis is very talented. But well, you know, he put in a lot of effort. He went to the school. He he had. Yeah, the, he went to Juilliard. Right. So yeah, he, he paid his dues. Yeah. <laughs> Miles did all those guys, all those jazz guys. They've really paid their dues. Yeah. Um, they didn't just pick it up and then things start happening and they learned how to improvise and they had these incredible voices. They were studying each other. Um, there was one of Miles Davis's uh, colleagues is a famous saxophonist named Cannonball Adderley. And mm. um, there was a, I remember a saxophonist in Los Angeles, uh, older than me, who was obsessed with Cannonball. And he would memorize all his sto- solos and study them and practice them. And he was a, a, he's a professional who's quite accomplished in his own right. He would sleep in Cannibal Adderley's T-shirt, <laughs> um, but he was. You pay your dues and you study this. The, Mar- the Marcellus brothers, they're, 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 they would say their father would would always say, you know, this is you have got to pay your dues here. Mm. Um, and that family is, quote quote unquote, so talented because they they understood very early on and they had the right guidance to to work hard at their craft. Sure. All right. What's your another what point on? is simply keep returning. Um, for me, keep returning to the manuscript. For me, I would say better. T- in my opinion, better to write one good novel than a collection of mediocre or even weak ones. Um, other writers that I was workshopping with or I was getting feedback with, they're they're always surprised that I kept coming back to it over the years. They're like, "Wow, you're still working on that." Oh, wow, you're still working on. That. Oh, really? Wow. And yeah, it was over a long time. But my my goal was always I'd rather have one done well, um, and then. Then, then, then move on to something else. And I did believe, I did believe in it. I believe I had a rich setting with all the history in it. I, I felt felt the story was at least good enough. Um, so it was just a question of working out the pros. And and I believed again, you could you can figure that out with enough work. So I kept coming back to it. So my advice is, if you unless you think you don't have a good concept, unless you think that you're you, if you're trying to write a um, a story that's a bit more commercial, well then yeah, you better have a good plot. Um, and if you don't, then maybe you should give up on that plot or figure out a way to fix it. That's a major change. But if you're, if you're writing something that's more literary, then you need to, to, to get your writing. Um, you can do that too. You, you can, you can get your writing to a place where it's, it's clean enough where the characters are carrying the story and you understand how to make them work. But I would, I would just say, keep going back. I'm surprised that people who've worked very, very hard on a novel and they give up and they move on to something else without first trying to get that other one right. Mm. And I would rather put in a few more years to get it right. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah. Almost your number five. And lastly, um, I would say one thing that came late to me uh, is I would say dip further into your characters. Um, Modern, I've noticed when I read modern fiction versus older fiction, modern fiction is actually quite indulgent about this in this regard. And you and we probably need to be that way, too, in fact. Um, and I didn't this is probably the last thing that came to me in the editing process. And I what I would do to try and 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 flesh out my character better uh, wasn't you could do these exercises where you psycho, psychoanalyze your characters or create cards of who they are and etc. But I think just a very simple thing. It's, it's but it's very meticulous. Is to go through the manuscript with any given character. Every scene with that character, every sentence with that character, that is about that character, and see if you can dip further into that character by just one or two sentences. What can you add that takes the reader into their experience with just one or two experiences, one or two sentences, but every time? Mm. So I would go back to the manuscript with the main character who I needed to flesh out more. And, I, and every single time that I thought that she was experiencing something, I would say, OK, let me dip in with just another one or two sentences to... to explore what she's going on so the reader better understands her internal world and then um, to add on to that also here and there you can add a paragraph that actually does a little that does a glimpse into their backstory that goes back much further and so again you learn something else about that character if you're if you're worried about your characters 
which um, I needed to be to get my manuscript up to par, then I think that's a good way to, to tackle it. You go back and you look for any and every opportunity to to get to add something so that readers better understand what's going on internally with that character. And that and occasionally that can even be an extra paragraph of just backstory or something where they learn something new about right. about the character. Thank you for sharing your your top tips on uh, editing your your manuscript. And uh, I wonder what uh, projects you've got coming up. Well, what I have coming up right now is that my my band um, that I, I lead and I do the songwriting for um, is called Shaolin Fez, and it's actually um, it's a pretty large group here in Hong Kong. I use multiple colleagues from the Hong Kong Philharmonic um, to create a symphonic sound. Uh, the style is kind of acid jazz or R and B, sometimes cinematic. Last year, we had a crowdfunding campaign where we raised enough money to release another CD. So um, I'm currently working on that, which is my summer project with recording and editing. And hopefully we will release that this fall, which will be our EP. I'm very excited about it. And we are um, pledging 100% of sales towards refugee relief. So this getting producing this CD... Um, and re- launching it and promoting it will easily keep me quite busy for the next six months. And uh, so that's what's in front of me right now. Hopefully after that, I'll get back to write, to working on my second novel. Yeah. Um, I did do a lot of research for a historical fiction novel, um, but honestly, as I mentioned before, there's a modern one that I think would be uh, quite exciting to write as well. And, uh, but I'm, I'm, I am confident uh, that I've learned enough that it won't take a decade for the, the second <laughs> one to write. I'm, I'm I'm quite confident about that. Can you give us? Because you're just about to, um, as we're recording this, you're just about to take your summer break um, from your duties in the Philharmonic. Can you give us a little sneak peek as to what's coming up in the the next season? The next season with the Philharmonic. Well, yes, we we start again in um, in at the last week of. August. Our music director is Jan van Sveden, who is um, actually a quite famous Dutch conductor who has also um, been appointed the music director of the New York Philharmonic. So he's kind of, he's quite well known. So he's the, he's the New York Philharmonic's director, our, our music director. And the main, the biggest things we have next year is that we're going to a residency in Beijing where we will perform Wagner's Valkyrie, um, which I believe will be the first all Chinese produced version of Valkyrie in China um, if you include Hong Kong Philharmonic as a Chinese orchestra and uh, later on in the season we're doing um, the, the final installment of the ring cycle which is Gata Damarang which uh, this is also it's been a project ongoing that we've been recording as well which is the first time the ring cycle has been um, performed in Hong Kong in mm. fact so those those are some pretty big things we have coming up actually the Philharmonic is doing quite well these are, these are good times yeah sure well we really look forward to that and uh, Samuel Ferrer thank you so much for coming in and for sharing your thoughts about your, your novel The Last Gods of Indochine uh, my pleasure thank you so much Hong Kong Writer Circle podcast, episode 32, The Last Gods of Indochine, was produced by me, Simon Overton. For more information about this show and all of our other activities, please visit our website, hkwriterscircle.com. Excerpts were from The Last Gods of Indochine by Samuel Ferrer, published by Signal 8 Press. The podcast theme music was Jingle Jazz by Quantum Jazz from the album End of Line, used under the terms of a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. The interlude music was Time Does Not Grey by Shaolin Fez from the album Calm Your Storm, used with permission. If you are an author, publisher or musician and would like to collaborate on an episode of this podcast or for any other feedback, please email hello at hkwritercircle.com and use the subject line podcast. Thanks as always to Katrina Tay for the podcast artwork.